Hello and welcome to this video of the course Answer Set Solving in Practice. My name is Javier Romero and in this video we are going to do the exercise on basic language constructs of the language part of the course. In this exercise we are given this logic program P with some choice rules, one cardinality rule and one integrity constraints and we have to compile this program into a normal logic program P prime using the translations that we have seen in the course. And in particular, we have to use this uh, translation with the atoms X, I, J to translate the cardinality rule. And after we have done that, we have to find the stable models of P and also the stable models of this program P prime that we have built in the previous part of the exercise. And just before we start, Let's go and have a quick look at the slides of the course that are relevant for this exercise. This is the slide where we show how to embed in normal rules the integrity constraints. So given an integrity constraint of this form, this is translated into this normal rule using the new symbol X. And here you have some example programs with integrity constraints under stable models. And in a later slide, you have here the translation of the integrity constraints to normal rules and also the stable models of the translation that coincide with the original ones. Now about, about choice rules, you have this slide where it's explained how do we embed them in normal rules, giving a choice rule of this form. This is translated into all these normal rules. And here again, an example with its stable models. And the translation of the example is shown here. Also with its stable models that if we project them over the original atoms, coincide with the stable models that we had initially. And now about cardinality rules. If we have one of these forms, this is translated into all these rules. And as before, afterwards, you have an example program with a cardinality rule that has some stable models. And here you have the translation into normal rules and the stable models of this translation. That again, if you project them on the original atom, what you get is the same as what you have in the original program. Right. So this was all for this quick review. So if there's something that you don't understand well, please go and have a look again at the slides and watch the very nice videos from Torsten where he explains this very well. And here, let's go on and start with the exercise. Here I have written our logic program P and we have to translate it into a normal logic program. And we can do it one rule after the other. So let's start with this choice rule. Here we see that for choice rule of this general form, they are translated into these normal rules. But in this case, it's very simple. We don't have any of these atoms. So actually, this is the only part that matters for us. So we have this atom to represent the fact that the body always holds because this is a fact. And then we have these other two rules here. So let's do this for our case. We can just write here a star to represent that the body of the rule holds. And then we have that A, if A is star, and we also add the uh, additional atom A prime to represent the case where A does not hold. And then we have this just like this for the A, for the first for the first uh, choice rule. Now let's do the second one. And if we go again to the slide, in this case, we have a body, an atom in the body and an atom in the head. So basically what we have is this part of the translation. We don't need any of those. And then we have that the body of the rule holds and for this, we use this new atom B star if A holds. And then that B is in the set if B star is in the set. And we do not have B prime. And then for B prime, we have like this, that it's there if we do not have to be. 
So let's jump for a moment over the cardinality rule and do the integrity constraint. And here we can go to the slide. And all we have to do is to add a new atom here in the head and also negate it in the body. Then let's call this new atom D prime. And then we have something like this. Then we have translated choice rules and the integrity constraints. And now we only have to translate the cardinality rule. Let's do that. Here we have how to embed a cardinality rule of this form where we have an atom A0 in the head and this cardinality constraint in the body. And what we do is we replace this rule by this one where we have the same atom in the head, but in the body we have this atom X1, L, where L is the lower bound of the cardinality constraint. And additionally, we will add all these rules and we will see this um, for our exercise in a moment. Good, so then first we have to replace the rule by this one, and we do this here, where we have this. So then we are going to replace it by the rule d if x 1, comma 2, because 2 is the lower bound that we have here. And now what we have to do is to add some rules to define this atom x 1, 2. And let's stop now for a moment and spend a few minutes understanding what do these atoms of predicate X mean. And I will write here the meaning of such an atom. So if we have X of I, J, this means that after position I included, so the position I is included, there are at least J literals satisfied. Okay, so then, for example, if we think about what's the meaning of X of 1, 1, this means that after position 1, so after position 1 is the one of the A, so taking into account A, B, and not C, there is at least one literal satisfied. So this basically means that either A or B or not C is satisfied. And I just will write this in, in logical notation so that we have it here written. So this would mean something like this, that either A, B or not C do hold. Now, if we had X, 1, 2, that is exactly what we have here in the rule. This means that after position 1, so after the A, there are at least two literals that are satisfied. So among A, B, and not C, so after the A, there are at least two that are satisfied. And this is actually what this, the whole cardinality constraint means. That's why we write it there, replacing it. And in logical notation, we could write it like this. So either we have A and B, or we have A and not C, or we have B, and not C. Okay, so at least two of them must hold. Now, as another example, consider the case X to zero that says that after position two, so taking into account just the B and the not C, at least zero hold. And given that it's always the case that at least zero hold, this is the same as saying true, right? We can replace it. We can represent it by the symbol true because it will always be the case that after some position, in this case, position two, at least zero literals hold. And just let's do one example before we move on. So if we have this X31 means that after position three included, so this just refers to, to the literal not C, at least one is satisfied. So then this is basically the same as saying that not C holds, right? Because it's the only one that is after position three. Okay, 
Good. So this was a bit uh, of an explanation about it, but now we have to add the rules that define this predicate. And basically what we are, and for this, what we are going to do is to apply uh, the what is explained in the slides. Let's do that. Let's get back to here and start with the case where i equals one, and we have to consider all the case between zero and L, and L has value 2, so we have to consider K, 0, 1, and 2. And let's write the first case where we have I equals 1 and K equals 0. So then this basically becomes that X, 1, comma, 1, if X, 2, comma, 0, and A, because A is the first um, literal in the our cardinality constraint of the exercise, and then we also have x one zero if x two zero, right? So we see here we have this x two zero, and with the a, and here if the a happens, then we move to x one one, we derive x one one, and in any case we always derive x one zero if we have x two zero. Good, and then for the case where now with k equals 1, we just have to replace these things. And for the case k equals 2, which is the last one, we just have to do this, this replacement. Okay, and then we have to move on to the case where i equals 2, and here we would have a b, and we have to replace like the rest of the things. Okay, so let's do that. And something that we are going to do, instead of writing this first and this second, we do it the other way around because I think it's it's easy to understand when we do the whole the whole exercise. Then let's write this down here. So for the case where we have x to zero, we consider the first case and the second where a holds, and here we have we derive x10 in this place and x11 one, one here. Right, so I will read it just now. So if after two, at least zero holds and a holds, then we know that after one, at least one holds. Now let's do here with x21 and x21 where a holds. Then we know here that after one, at least one holds. And we know here that after one, at least two holds. And now for the case with 2, 2. And we have that after 1, we know at least 2 hold. And in this case, that after 1, at least 3 do hold. Good. So now let's do it for the for, for position second. And we have to replace all these ones by 2s, all these 2 by 3s, and all these a's by b's. So x two zero if x three zero x two one if x three one sorry if x three zero comma b and then x two one if x three one and let me copy this again so I don't get lost. Then I have here x2, 2, and then I here have here the, the last 2 with x3, 2. This gives me x2, 2, and this gives me x2, 3, right? So then you can just check that you have for each of these. We have and you see that you have this this structure kind of here, right? That you have two atoms that are the same here and here and here. It's nice that you. I think it's helpful for you to to do this kind of check so that you see that you are not making mistakes. And now let's do just for the third case, and it's same story. So x three zero if x four zero, then I just write 
already here the x for 0 and here I have to write not c and in this case I derive x3 1 and now let's do for x for 1 and x for 1 not c and I just will write all the others here because I have found out that I think this makes it easier not to make mistakes so then here I get x 3 1 x 3 2 and then again here I derive x 3 2 and here I derive x 3 3 we can check so here we have these related bodies these ones these ones and then these heads are the same in the same way as the heads here were the same okay and here we have the b's the a's and the notices. Good, and something that we should not forget is that we also had this here, x m plus 1, 0, and given that the n here is 3, then we have x 4, comma 0, and we have to add it then here at the end. x 4, comma 0. Good. So then this basically finishes the, the first part of the exercise where we had to write the program P prime. That is the result of translating this logic program with choice rules, integrity constraints and cardinality rules into a normal logic program, which is this P prime. So this is the first part of the exercise. And then in the second part of the exercise, we have to find the stable models of this program and the stable models of this other program. So then let's start with the stable models of this program. Let's start by cleaning this. And now for those of you who have seen our tutorial on easy answers at programming, you can see that this is an easy program because there's no recursion, right? So this rule, the body of this rule, so you can see that this, the first rule, second rule depends on the first one, the third one depends on the previous one, and this depends on the pre, on the one before. So uh, this is a program without recursion, and then we can simply compute the stable models of this program by applying the rules in order. Then for this, we can, so initially we have the empty stable model, and after applying the choice rule, we have the empty set and the set that contains the atom A. Then when we apply this rule, this is telling us that if we have A in our set, then we may add B to the set. So this sends us here to the set B, sorry, to the set A. And here, there's also the option that we have A, B. And here we keep the empty set. And now, with this rule, it's telling us that if we have at least two of these elements, then we have to add D to the set. Then, of course, we do not have the C because there's no rule that can give it to us. So then, if we have one of these two, then we should add the D. Then, um, here... We do not have either A or B, so this goes to the empty set, but in both these sets we have the A, and here we also have the B, so then we have to add the D to both of them. And now to finish, we apply this integrity constraint that tells us that we should eliminate an answer set or a stable model if it does not have the and then basically what it does is it eliminates this set and then in the end we have a d oops sorry here i forgot the b before we have a b and d and then these two are the stable models of this logic program and we can write it here stable models of p are uh, a d and A, B, and D. Okay, so here what we have done is we have applied the rules in order and then we know that the, the, the sets that we obtain at the end are the stable models or the answer sets of the logic program. And now for those of you who have not uh, <coughs> uh, 
uh, studied this part on easy answer set programming, we can think also from what we what we know about logic programs. So if we have this choice rule, then we can either not have A in the set, and this is this part of the branch that we have built, or we can have A in our stable model, right? This justifies A in the set. And if A is in the set, then we have the option of adding B, but we do not necessarily must have it. So that's why if we consider just these two rules, these are the three stable models of that of those two rules. And then we have the rule that tells us to add D in this case. That's why these three are the stable models of these rules. And then the integrity constraint simply eliminates the stable models that satisfy the body, and this satisfies the body, hence we eliminate them, well, these two survive. And then that's why we can see that these two are the stable models of the logic program P. Good. So now, with this in mind, we can move on to looking for the stable models of the logic program P prime, that is this normal logic program. We will do it with in two different ways. The first one is the fastest, and I think this is probably the one you want to use, but I will also do the sec another one. So the first one relies on the fact that we know that these are the stable models of the logic program P, and that the stable models of P prime are just a kind of extension of these two stable models. So I'll explain this a bit better. So we know that now the stable models, let me write it here, the stable models of P prime will be A comma D together with something and A comma B D together with something, because this is how this translation works. It will keep, it will have one stable model with these atoms and without the C and without the B, and some additional atoms like this star or prime atoms and also some X atoms. And there will be another stable model that has A, B, D and doesn't have C and has some of these auxiliary atoms, but nothing else. There will be no more stable models. Right? So then we can rely on this in a way so that we don't have to do any search anymore. Right? Here we were building the whole tree to search for the stable model, but here it's easier. Given that we know that these are the two, two stable models, we can just see what additional atoms do we add to these two sets. Okay, then let me clean this here a moment, and then we will see what happens there. Okay, good. So then uh, something that I think is useful at this point is to have a look at this uh, lot of rules that we have here to see whether we can, what we can reason easily about them. So we have here that this rule gives us x for zero. So x for zero must belong to all stable models of this program. And if we have x for zero, then we can derive x three zero, and if we have x three zero, we can derive x two zero, and with x two zero, we can derive x one zero. So, actually, you see, we could always just add the facts four zero, three zero, two zero, and one zero instead of, instead of adding all these rules. But let's go on with this. So, also, what we know is that. Um, given that there's no rule for C in the logic program, C is always going to be false, right? So then we can say that this little as not C are satisfied, and then we can derive from here x31. And if you think, stop now for a moment and think about it intuitively, it makes sense that we derive x31 because uh, after position 3, there's at least one literal that holds. So this means that C doesn't hold, and this is what we just have just said. So then we can derive X31. And with um, X31, we can derive X21. And with X21, we can derive X11. Right? So then we have all these atoms with 3, 1, 2, 1, and 1, 1. And what... Um, from this, we can also realize that now this rule here 
uh, becomes uh, we don't have to care anymore about it because we already know that X, its head will hold and similarly with this rule here about x to 1 and similarly with this one about x 1 1 okay and what else we have here we can all, if we look at these rules here they all have these atoms x for 1 and x for 2 that do not belong to any head of the logic program and then these rules will never be fired so we can write here an x so that we don't care about, right? These rules can never fire, can never prove anything because those atoms um, never cannot be true because they do not belong to any head. And I think we can do something else here. Yeah, we can apply the same reasoning on this side because now, given that we can that these rules about these rules about x3, 2 will never fire. We say we know that these two rules will also never fire, right? There's no way to derive, um, given that there's no way to derive x41 or x42, there's no way to derive x32 or x33. Well, here what matters, there's no way to derive x32, and then there's no way that these rules are going to fire. So then we can just skip these ones. And then basically, what this tells us is that we only have to care about these four rules. And actually, this rule is, is kind of irrelevant for our, for, well, it, I think for, for just for knowing what are the stable models um, of, let me just step back. Normally what, what one can do with this kind of translation is, if you do the translation and then looking at the stable models of the translation, you can go back to the stable models of the logic program. But if we are doing that, also keep in mind that this atom, these rules about X13 are not useful because we are we care about the atom X12, but not about the atom X13. So for that purpose, we could also just not care about this one because the atom X13 does not appear anywhere here, and it's unrelated to the atom X12. And similarly, we could do also some kind of reasoning in that direction, also with this atom X10, X11. And actually, if in a solver you implement this kind of translation, you would be very careful about this thing so that you are not adding more rules to the solver that you don't care about. Okay, but just here, let's focus on the exercise. Then... Um, to determine the stable models of P prime, among all these rules here, we just have to care about these four. But of course, we have to write here that we have this set of atoms, let's call it X, where we have the atoms that we know that hold for sure, like X10, X20, X30, X4, oops x40, x11, x21, and x31, right? This is what we have. Okay, I also, we also have the x, I oh know, x40 is already there, sorry. I have it here. Good. Okay, then um, we have to see now if we have, um, for the case where, so this is settled, so then let's add it here. This will belong to both the stable models. And now we have to see what, whether this x22, x12, and x13 are added to each of these, and also what of these star and prime atoms are also added to each of them. Good. So then um, if we if we look here, we have for the case where we have A and D, B is not there. So let me write this now here. So B is not, let's consider this case again, A, D. So B is not there. So then this rule doesn't fire, right? Because B is not there. 
And then these two rules do not fire either. But here, this rule is applicable because we have x to 1, that we can underline it already. And we also have the a there, right? So then in this case, we will derive x of 1, 2. We can add it here, x of 1, 2. And now uh, let's see what happens on the other side. So here we are going to derive the a star. And now we cannot, given that we have the a, we cannot derive a prime. So this rule doesn't give us anything. And then with these two, given that we do not have the a prime, because this rule is the only that could give us and we have the a, then we can get the a from there. And then with the a, okay, so let me underline this one. So with the a, we derive b star. So we have the b star here. And now we are considering this case where we have a and d. So b is not there. b is not going to be there. Hence, we derive b prime. And now with b prime, this rule becomes blocked. And then from here, we have derived x12. So we get the d, which is the d also that we have here, right? So with these three things, we get the d. And now, given that we have the D, this rule uh, cannot fire and we don't get it. So then we have just to collect the heads that we have derived. So we have derived the A star and also the B star and also the B prime. And I think this is it. Let me check it. Yes, I think this is good. So then we have to do now the case with A, B, D. And here, let me clean this a bit. So here we were considering just these rules on this side. And also let's clean it here. And we will review this process. Okay, so then let's see what happens on this side. So in this case, we have the B. And given that we also have x31, we derive x22. And with x22, we, we get x12 from here already, but we could also get it from this other rule. And given that we have x22 and a, we also derive x13. So then we have to add this x22, x12, and x13. And you see, like looking at this, this is telling us that after, after position one, three literals hold, and this is the case in this case where we have a, b, and not c. So then let's add them already here. So we have x12 like before, but we also have now x13 and x22. Good. And then let's get back to, to see this auxiliary atom. So of course we have the A star. And again, as before here, with this rule, given that A belongs to the set, this rule will not fire. And and we will derive the A from here. Now with the A, we derive the B star. And in this case, um, what we also have is that given that we have the B, this rule doesn't fire, so we do not get the B prime. But now, And then from this one, we derive the B. Again, here we have X of 1, 2, so we derive the D from this rule. And this rule is blocked because the B forbids, the D, sorry, forbids firing this rule. Good, so then we can do as before and just add the heads of the rules 
that have fired here, well, of course, we don't have to add the A, the B, and the D because they were already there. So we just have to add the A star, the B star, and that's it. Good. So then these are the two stable models of P prime. And also now something that may be helpful for you is to have again a look at these stable models to see if these make sense. So in this case where we have A and D, <coughs> we have that um, that after position one, at least two hold because we have A and not C. But if we also have the D, we will also have that after position two, two hold, and after position one, three hold. And this is what we would expect, right? After position two, two hold, and after position one, three hold. And then what we have is that in both cases, um, given that we have, so we have the A star, and in both cases, we, we have guessed, we have the A here, and then we derive the B star. So both have A star and B star. And now what happens is that once we have the B star, we have here this cycle where there are two possible options, right? One chooses, in one we have, we decide for the B and in another we have for the B prime. And then we see this here in this stable model with B prime and this with the B, right? So I think it's interesting for you maybe to do this kind of reasoning afterwards to check that the results that you obtain make sense. And of course, then both of them drive the x12 so that you get the d on both sides. And then this constraint, which is just a kind of rewriting of this integrity. So this rule that is a kind of rewriting of this integrity constraint um, <clears throat> doesn't, uh, doesn't eliminate any of them or doesn't affect them because we have the not the here in the body while we have derived it from there. Good. So then this was it. So at this point, you could really just uh, maybe stop the video and you don't have to watch anymore. But what I'm going to do now is to do the exercise like in the old way, just starting from the normal logic program in green and doing this reasoning by cases that we were doing before. Of course, we know. Yes, let's 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 do that and move on for doing that. But for the exercise, it's enough what we have just done now. Okay, this is just an, what I'm going to do now. Is just another way of solving the exercise. Good. So I've reorganized things a bit. So just remember, here we have these four rules, which are the only ones who are. Uh, relevant for us because the rest of the atoms here, we know whether they hold or not. And these rules, we know they will never be fired. And well, we have to consider now all these rules in green, and we will find the stable models of this logic program P prime using the method we have used for other exercises. So now when we start reasoning about this program, we know that in all the stable models, these atoms in X will hold just by following the same reasoning that we followed before. And we also have that, uh, as we said before, these atoms x41, x42, and x, um, x32, and also x23, they have to be false because there's no way that we can derive them. So write this, we can uh, write it uh, here right away that we know that these cannot belong to any stable model. Well, let's have, check it again. So we have the ones for four, these ones, and we also have this for X, um, X33. Okay, we also have to say that X33, we can derive it and X32, we cannot derive it. So it's also X. 3, 3 that we cannot derive. And we also have here that x, then x23 cannot be derived, right? Because if you just look at it, it doesn't make sense that after b, there are at least three um, literals that hold, right? And then what we also know is that given that this is a fact, then we have a star also. And um, given that c does not belong to any rule here, we can also derive not C. 
right? And then with this a star, we can simplify this rule, and then we are left with this cycle through negation, and then we also have for the case where we derive the a. Well, let's stop there. Um, good. So then this is what we know that will belong to all stable models just by reasoning about the the logic program and now we cannot uh, deduce anything else here so then let's say let's reason by cases and say okay then let's see what happens if we consider a stable model where a does not belong to them or on the other hand where we consider stable models where a does belong to them right so then we have that if we do not have the a then we derive the a prime and we say prime of course this rule is blocked and now if we do not have the a then the we do not derive b star because this is the only rule that could give it to us so then we will have not b star and then if we do not have the b star then we will have, we cannot have the B because this is the only rule that can give us the B. So we have not B. And then with not B, we must have B prime. And now to continue looking here, we have to see what happens with X, one, two. But now we can just see that given that, we, well, let's, let's continue. Let's not move that fast. So we have not B. So then there's no rule that can give us X to two, because remember this, we couldn't have, because there was no way that we could get X three, two. Basically we have here not X three, two. Hence we have that X to two cannot belong to a stable model. If A does not belong to a stable model, then we have this here, and then if x to 2 does not belong to a stable model, then these two rules are cannot give us anything. And here, given that a does not belong to the stable model, we can also not derive x1, two, right? So then we have to have here not x1 and not x, not x1, two, and not x1, three, not x1, two and not x, one, three. Good, so then now that we are done with this part of the program, we can get back to here and given that we do not have this one, then we have not D because there's no way that we could derive the D. And then we are left here. So first let me write things correctly there. Given that we have the node D, if you see, we are left with this kind of rule that says not the prime gives us the prime. And we know that then there will be no, no stable model on this side. But just to make it easy, now we can make a decision on D prime. So on this side, if we make a decision on reason by cases on D prime, say, okay, now we know basically at this point, what we know is that all these atoms belong to a stable model. And if a does not belong to a stable model, also this must hold. And let's see what happens if, if D prime does not belong to, to a stable model where A also does not belong, then with this rule, we must derive D prime. So this says, if a stable model has, does not have D prime, it must have D prime. Then we can conclude that it can't be the case that the stable model does not have D prime, right? And on the other side, if we uh, see what happens if the stable model has the prime, then we see that to derive the prime, it must be the case that, that it doesn't have the prime. Hence, there's no way that we could have an stable model with 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 the prime if the stable model didn't have the A. So then we see that there's no stable model that does not have the A. Then we can go through the other part and see, okay, what happens if we have A in a stable model? Then, okay, but for this, let me clean this quickly. First here, at the bottom, and then here on this side. So 
so that we can reason about the program. Good. So then if we have A, then we must have not a prime to be able to derive it, right? Because if not, there's no way that A could belong to a stable model. And then this rule becomes blocked because we have the A. And then from here, if we have the A, we should have B star. And now with this B star, if we kind of simplify this rule because this holds, then we are left with this typical cycle, B if not B prime, B prime if not B, that gives us two stable models, one with B and one with B prime. So we could make a decision there. But now look, already at this point, so we don't know the value of the B, but now knowing the value of the A, we already can derive X of one, two here, right? We have the X to one from somewhere there, yeah. So given that we have the A, we can derive X of one, two. Right, we can get it from this rule here. And then this rule, we don't care about it. So here on this side, we just have to see whether we have x to 2 if we had the b. And given that we have the a, if we have the b that gives us x to 2, then we will derive x1, 3. But we have already derived x1, 2. So then we know we will get the d. And we can get the D there. And then since we have the D, this rule is blocked. So there's no way to get D prime. So we know already here, we do not have the D prime. And then basically what we are left is with this cycle that allows us to choose the B. And if we have the B, we get X to two and X one three. So then let's do this. On this side, let's see what happens if in a stable model that has the A, it does not have to be on this side or it has to be on the other side. So without the B, we derive B prime. Okay, let's do this. Without the B, we derive the B prime and then this part becomes blocked. So we do not have, so, okay, we have B prime from that one. And then if we come to look at here, we derive X to two and X one three. Oops, not sorry, this was the other way around. So we do not derive, sorry for this, we do not derive x22, two, two, and without x22, two, two, we also do not derive x13. Good, and on the other side, it's a bit like uh, it's the other way around. So if we, in this case, If we do not have, if we don't have the B, then we must have not B prime, because this is the only rule that can give it to us. We have not B prime. And then this rule becomes blocked. And this is what makes sense, because otherwise we would derive B prime. And now with the B here, we get X to two, and with X to two, we get X one three. Good. So then, and then if you look a bit more carefully at it, there's no other, we have given evaluation to all atoms. And you can see also that these two, the stable models that represent, are represented by these two branches, they, um, so these sets of, the sets of atoms that are true in these two branches, then they are a stable model that satisfy all the rules. And now if you do the redact, they are the minimal models of, of the redact. And now just to finish, we can check that what we obtain here is the same as these two sets. And I think this, you can do it just now. Well, let's, let's do this quickly. So let's paint it a bit yellow. So here we will have Let's make it a bit like this. So here we have the X. Here, I'm just marking the positive uh, literals because this is what we are painting below. We have the A, the B star, X1, 2, D. Here we have the B prime. And here we have B, X2, 2, two, and X1, 3. And then, um, so on this part, we have A, D. 
and we do not have to be, so then this corresponds to this stable model here. So we have we have A and D, like here, A and D. We have the set X, of course, and then we have X12, A star, B star, and B prime. And here we have X12, B star, A star, and the B prime here, right? You see then this is the same, and here we have also A, D, and the X, so let's underline everything. Right? And then if we look at the other side, then we have A, B, D, X, and all this. And here we have the X, A, D, and B. And then we have X, 1, 2. And now we must have X, 1, 3, X, 2, 2, and the star atoms like A star and B star that was here. Good. So then this concludes the exercise. And again, I just repeat, this was just uh, another way of doing the exercise following the method we have followed in other exercises. And you can choose what is better for you. I think it's simply faster if you, if you use the previous method where you take advantage of the fact that you know that these are the stable models of P to write the stable models of P prime. But also just to give you a bit of perspective on this, the idea of it on the of the of this part of the course is to see that uh, one can translate this program to this normal logic program so that if you have a solver that only works with normal logic programs, you could just build a translator that translate this program into a normal logic program, and then from the stable models of this normal logic program, you extract the stable models of of the original logic problem, right? So you could think that really the ma this using this implementation, the machine would get this translated to the green program, get the stable models of the green program, and then from this, just keep the original atom and tell the user, look, these are the stable models of the original atom. So actually this trick that we are doing that we first compute the stable models of P and then using that, we take the stable models of P prime. I think this is good for you to do the exercise, but it does not relate well to how things could be implemented in a solver. And of course, just to finish, it's not the case that always these rules have to be translated to normal rules, because for example, in Klingo, there's uh, a native implementation of, of, of some of these uh, extended constraints of the language. So it's not the case that this is always translated to normal rules, but it can be translated to normal rules. Good. So thanks for paying attention. I hope you have enjoyed it and then see you in another video. Ciao.